Ben, hello everyone online. Uh, welcome everyone here. It's my great pleasure today uh, to announce that we have Rebecca Böhme here for a talk. Um, Rebecca is assistant professor at the university in uh, Lynn Shipping and this for social and effective, uh, at the Center for Social and Effective Neuroscience. So initially you start uh, studied at uh, Heidelberg um, then been to Max Planck in Tübingen, moving also around in Berlin, and then now for some years in, uh, in Shipping, and um, is visiting here today to tell us about um, interactions between people that we hear often don't hear so many uh, talks about, also like in the context of uh, touch, and also maybe to be said about you, like recently just received an uh, ERC grant. Yes. Also, congratulations. <laughs> um, and uh, we are very excited uh, for your talk on experiencing the self through touch. Yes, thank you. Okay, so this will be interesting by not seeing my next slide. So let's see how, how good I can do the slide karaoke setup here. Um, yes, so if we talk about the self, uh, we should probably know what we're talking about what the self is, right? Um, but I don't really have time to go into all the philosophical discussions, even though I would like to do that. Um, so I kind of like to stick with the idea that kind of the self is a hierarchical construct, it's kind of a multi-layered construct, and it's typically presented, um, for example, by William James, who we see here, but also many other people where in a kind of a hierarchical structure where you have of a lower level self um, can be the minimal self or the bodily self and then you can have higher order aspects of the self like reflective or social self and then kind of an even higher level which is the spiritual self or can be something more like autobiographical self the narrative self so there are many different ways how you can define this but this is kind of one way how you can look at this but however i would say that basically the bodily self is actually inherently social. So I would move the social self one layer down. And why would I say this? I think self other distinction is the basis for selfhood, a very important aspect of knowing that this is me and this is the outside world and these are the other people. And we learn about self other distinction. We know, learn this distinction between this is me and my body and the boundaries of my body compared to the outside world very early in life. And this is first experienced through touch, and this is something that we already, all of us already learn inside of the womb, where we can see that um, babies show movements where they actually touch their own face, as we can see here on top, or they touch the other, so the social other in that case would of course be the womb, so the wall of the womb, which is another person. So it's like the mother's body, but like in a way, it's, it, this is already kind of a social interaction, right, because they're touching another human. Or if you have twins, which you can see here at the bottom, you can see that they actually also touch each other. So they show directed movement at the other twin and touch the other body. And kind of just as a side note, um, I think it's really important to keep this in mind that we all develop in this co-embodied state, right? This is not something that's special for like motherhood. And this is something that we all go through. It's something that we all experience is that we all developed inside of another body where we have to co-embody with this other body and there we have to go through co-homeostasis or co-allostasis with this other body to regulate our physical needs. So we know that touch is extremely important not only in this early life but like after we are born then already like the first interactions that babies have with their parents is mostly through touch and like the visual system isn't developed that well yet and the auditory system isn't developed that well yet. And we know that touch is extremely important. So we know that, for example, there are many studies that show this, but for example, from this study where what they did was that they had um, preemies, uh, babies that were born too early, and they had two different groups. They had a contact group and a control group. And the contact group was just being carried on, on the body of um, the caregiver as much as possible, as much as was, was basically uh, yeah, available, even though they had, of course, to, to go to a lot of medical procedures. And what you can see is that this group of babies that had received this early contact in life developed better in a way. Um, after six months, there was a clear difference after 12 months. But what I find extremely fascinating is that you can see even a difference even after five years and after 10 years. 
So those babies that receive this early contact, bodily contact, they, they developed into kids that had more ability to emotionally regulate and that had, for example, better um, emotional and physical regulation. They, they had less problems falling asleep, for example. So you can see a clear difference of this very early intervention, even after 10 years. And of course, after um, these earlier phases where the baby is kind of more passive, it will also use the tactile sense a lot to explore the world around them. So does the baby stick everything into their mouth? This is, of course, also a tactile exploration of the world around us. So it's extremely important for us that we have the self other distinction. But of course, just kind of as a side note, it's also important that we have the ability for self other merging. So for empathy and for experiencing trust and love with other people, we also have to have some ability to merge our self with another self. So how can we use the sense of touch experimentally to understand the sense of self? So what we do in my lab is that we put people in the scanner, like you probably also do all the time, and um, we have a very simple task where we either ask them to touch themselves or we touch them on the arm or they touch an object, which is the control condition. And we use a very specific type of touch, kind of a nice, very slow stroking touch. We use skin to skin touch, no, no um, tools or anything to be more ecologically valid. And why do we use this very slow kind of stroking touch? This is because um, people have found that there's these very specific receptors that we have in the skin. So you might know about like A beta fibers. Um, receptors that respond specifically for vibration or to, to pressure, but the CT fibers, the C tactile fibers, are fibers that respond very specifically to a type of stimulus that seems to be just specific for kind of social human touch interaction. How do we know that? We know this from uh, recordings from actually from these fibers, from these CT fibers in humans where you can see that they, these fibers, they increase their firing rate in response to a very specific stimulus. So here we have the mean firing rate frequency of, of one of these fibers, these CT fibers, and you can see that they seem to prefer a certain type of stimulus. So this at the bottom, this is speed of stimulation of their um, receptive field, and you can see that they have this preferred speed of three centimeters per second. How do we know this? So what we can do is that we have um, this, the micronography technique, which is quite complicated, where you insert an electrode into the nerve fibers, actually in the arm, to record directly from the peripheral nerve fibers. And then you can find the receptive field, and you can do a couple of tests to figure out which kind of fiber you're recording from. And then you can stimulate the receptive field with different types of stimulation and see what these, these um, neurons respond to. And so what we see here is that they prefer these three centimeters per second. This is when they have show the highest firing frequency. But what we can also see, what I always think is really cool, is that they seem to prefer also different temperatures. So you can see that we have like a cool temperature here in blue and warm temperature in red, and then a neutral temperature, which is 32 degrees of Celsius, which is basically the temperature of our fingertips. And you can see that this is the the type of stimulus that they prefer the most. So kind of a slow stroking stimulus at 32 degrees, so fingertip temperature. And when we ask people how do they like these types of stimulations, then we can see that it also seems to be specifically this type of stimulus that they think is the most pleasant. Now your computer says it wants to update this. It's software, but I probably just cancel it. It's fine. It's, I think it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so people prefer this specific type of stimulus that also activates the CT fibers. And you don't need to worry, you know, when you go home, you don't need to worry when you want to like stroke your, your partner that you measure that this is only three centimeters per second because we can also intuitively know what is the correct speed. So there's a study where they have just asked people to come to the lab and just ask them to either stroke an artificial arm or their partner or their baby. And you can see it's very clear here for the partner that people preferred intuitively to use this three centimeters per second. So we know which kind of stimulus, which kind of tactile stroking people prefer. Um, 
but a baby doesn't look that convincing, but this is just because the babies were very fuzzy in the lab and they repeated this at home and then they found the same effect. It's very important though to just kind of point out that of course there are large individual differences. So of course not everybody likes this type of stimulus. And if you look at kind of like, of course this is just an average, this inverted U-shaped curve. And if you look at the individual data points, you can see that there's a large variation in what kind of, um, what kind of speed these people prefer. And you can see that also a lot of people actually rate this as unpleasant, right? This is actually below zero. So negative in a way they find the stimulation not that pleasant so before you go out and start stalking people at least in just a second make sure to to ask if they actually enjoy this or not so what happens in the brain when we use this type of stimulus and compare it to kind of a fast touch so kind of like a fast more like a rubbing kind of tactile stimulation we find that we specifically find activations in the insula so of course we also get activations in other areas but the activation is specifically different for the slight, slow type of touch compared to the fast kind of simulation is that we get, and this is from a meta-analysis, we get the posterior insula that specifically reacts to this type of simulation. And we know from many other studies right, that the insula is very important for perceiving the own body, for having interceptive perceptions, for perceiving kind of the bodily self in a way. So we use this type of touch when we put people in the scanner, we ask them to perform this kind of touch on their own arm, or we use that touch on their arm, and then the object is just a control for the movement that's happening during self-touch. So what we find in neurotypical participants is that we have a lot more activation in a lot of areas actually for other touch, so social touch compared to self-touch. So these are all the areas where we have more activity for touch by someone else compared to self-touch. And you, you can see, I mean, there's some prefrontal areas, it's the whole STG, TPJ, it's in the insula, and it's all, even here in smart sensory cortex. And this is in part driven by activations doing other touch. So we have activations doing other touch um, in smart sensory cortex, in the TPJ, and also in the insula. And it's also in part driven by actually deactivations doing self-touch. So when we look at self-touch, what we see is that we have some activity that is all here on the left side. And so this, we'll be using the right hand to stroke the left arm. So all of the activity that we have here is related, of course, to activations related to the touching hand. So of course, it's related to the motor activations, but also to the much sensory input from the touching hand. But we have see basically nothing here on the other side, which is the area responsible for the touched arm, right? And um, we see a lot of deactivations in blue and green um, with the peak of this in the temporal pole and here the whole SDG also deactivates. And then I was just interested in looking at, you know, do we see this pattern kind of like across the brain also in other regions? So I just looked at kind of the um, parameter estimates in regions that are interesting because they're kind of like along this um, smart sensory process processing pathway. And so you can see here in green, we have um, self-touch, so the de deactivation is doing self-touch. And then we have in blue being touched by someone else and in this brown color, the object touch condition. And then we have anterior insula where we see the same pattern, posterior insula where we see the same pattern. And then of course here in the left, this is what we just saw, we have the strong activations related to the touching hand where we have basically no activation or deactivation during self-touch in the other side of the smart sensory cortex. But then also if you look kind of in even lower, um, hierarchically lower areas like the thalamus or the brainstem, even here we see the same deactivations during self-touch. And then as a follow-up, I was interested to look at this, to go even further down. So what we're doing now in the lab is that we're looking at the spinal cord and we do fMRI at the same time simultaneously at the brain and the spinal cord to basically see if we can see that there's something similar happening already maybe in the spinal cord and also then whether there, we can find some connectivity patterns that kind of explain this. So this is very preliminary data here. Um, this is from our first sample of 20 people. This is just now just the spinal cord. And what you can see is that um, we have activations here in the ventral part of the spinal cord. So these are mostly motor activations, actually. And 
and you look at kind of the estimates, it also kind of makes sense. It's a bit more noisy. It's really hard to manage this, to image the spinal cord. It's very, very small. Um, but you can kind of see that it does make sense that there's some activations here during the motor conditions compared to the other condition. But we didn't, in this first sample, didn't find something that was very clearly related to the somatosensory input. So we have a second sample where we actually move just our, our box here um, that we're looking at a little bit higher up because we weren't exactly sure where is the correct level of the spinal cord to look at. And in this smaller sample, we find some activation here in the dorsal part of the spinal cord, which actually looks very similar to what we see in the brain, where we have um, activation during touch from someone else. And then we have something like no to deactivation during the self-touch. So it's very preliminary. This is 12 people. We are currently analyzing the full sample, but it looks like there might be something there that actually already in the spinal cord, there is this the same pattern that we have for deactivation during self-touch. So does this relate in any way to the higher order aspects of the sense of self? In the first study, um, we just had a very basic question here where we asked people about the uh, um, self-concept clarity. So it's basically a question of like, how well do you know who you are? You basically ask people like, you know, do you, could you explain who you are? Or could you kind of like, when you look back at yourself, could you say like who you were five years ago? So just how, how sure are they who they are? And we looked at areas that we think uh, might be interesting here and we found a correlation with the difference between other touch and self-touch in the anterior cingulate cortex and anterior and posterior insula. So of course this is correlational, but it's a first hint kind of that there might be a relation between this effect of like how big is the difference between touch by someone else compared to self-touch, the self-other distinction and a higher order aspect of the self. Now I want to follow this up and so to kind of have a more direct manipulation, um, I asked what actually happens to this tactile self other distinction during ego dissolution. So what we did in this study is that we um, gave people ketamine. Ketamine is um, also known as a model for um, certain aspects of schizophrenia. And um, it kind of at a low dose can um, cause dissociative experiences, so out of body experiences, basically. So we had people come to the lab and um, this is what I'm saying. So I asked what happens to self other distinction during ketamine administration, and we had people come to the lab two times. One time they got a placebo, one time they got ketamine during the scan, and they did the same touch task. And here's what we find. Um, there's also a preprint out if you're interested, you can have a look at that. Um, during the placebo condition, we basically replicated the same effect that we have more activations during other touch compared to self touch in certain areas specifically kind of the, the TPJ and, and posterior insular areas. And then we did see that the ketamine did really, the manipulation worked. So ketamine gave people dissociative experiences. So you see that doing placebo, this is kind of a, a questionnaire clinician administered scale where we ask them like, how much do they dissociate during the session? And we see that basically everybody went up compared to the placebo session. And there's actually a nice spread here also in how much people experience this dissociation. Now, if you look at brain activation during the ketamine session, we kind of see that it's a very similar pattern, but it's, you can already see that it looks weaker, it's smaller. And then, of course, we were specifically interested in the interaction effect. So this is what we find. It's, it looks kind of small, but this is at a very high um, threshold, like a little blue dot here. So this is... Um, at a, a high threshold of um, family wise error corrected um, for P smaller 0.05, so kind of like the highest um, SPM threshold that we can have. And when we look at this same cluster, basically at a, at a lower threshold, we can see that it's kind of a nice widespread cluster. This is this one that you see here in blue. And this is the, so this is an area where we find interaction between the ketamine condition and the placebo condition with the two touch conditions, other and self touch. And we had um, these regions down here, we had them pre-registered because we thought this is regions where we would find a difference. And you can kind of see that the cluster we find really very nicely sits kind of right in the middle of them. 
kind of touches a bit on some uncertainty cortex, touches on STG, also TPJ is over here, and it kind of extends all the way in here to the posterior insula. Does not touch the ACC. And when we look at the uh, estimates um, during different conditions, we can see that this interaction is mostly driven by the other touch conditions. So we see that other touch and self touch become more similar in this region during the ketamine condition compared to the placebo condition. So this is another hint at that there might really be a relation between kind of this very basic tactile self other distinction and the processing of self and other touch and kind of this higher level experience of the self, right? Because they all dissociate in this state, they all perceive that you know, self boundaries are dissolved and this is related to this change in how the brain processes self and other touch. So now we know what's going on in, um, in uh, healthy and neurotypical um, populations. Uh, what about new diverse and new psychiatric populations? So in the lab, we are also interested in um, different new psychiatric populations, two that we thought were very interesting to look at, specifically with regard to um, self other distinction and kind of some sensory processing are ADHD and autism. And why are we interested in that? This actually kind of came about when I talked to a clinician and just presented these results I had in neurotypicals and that person got very interested and said, like, we have to look at this in, in ADHD specifically because people and kids with ADHD and their parents they often have these very intense amount of sensory complaints, which is something that is not really investigated very much. So kids with ADHD, they often, they don't want to wear certain types of clothing because it's itchy or they don't want to brush their teeth because it's like the consistency feels weird or also they don't want to eat certain types of food. And it's something that we see very often in ADHD and also in autism. So we were interested in seeing whether this hypersensitivity somehow relates to the self other distinction. If you can see that maybe an increase in self other distinction could relate to hypersensitivity and then kind of, you know, if you have like a sharper boundary of yourself and you know, like this is your own body, then maybe anything, any sensory stimulation that comes from the outside might be something that's irritating, right? So we did the same task. We had, um, I'm starting with the ADHD study. We had a group of young adults who had an ADHD diagnosis and they came to the lab and did the same task in the scanner. And what we find here is that there's a clearer differentiation between self and social touch and ADHD. We find this in a way where we see that there's more deactivation actually during self touch in the insula, in the ADHD sample. And then we have more activation in some sensory cortex during touch from someone else in ADHD. So this study was very much this focus kind of on the neural processing. Um, we're currently doing a follow up where we also want to see if these such differences in self and other processing relate to actual symptomatology. So for example, how hyperactive or how distractible somebody is, because you could very well imagine, right, that like if you have this very clear differentiation between yourself and the outside world, and you have kind of feel like this is the boundary of my body, anything that comes from the outside is kind of disturbing or distracting. But then of course that can relate also to being more hyperactive because if something's itchy, then you become more active to kind of get away from the itch or if something is kind of uncomfortable, then you might be distracted very easily, right? Then we also have the study where we looked at anorexia and autism, and we combined these two because there's some research that claims that there might be an overlap in the symptomatology between the, these two. And so there's a co-occurrence and some 20 to 35% of people who have an autism diagnosis also have um, anorexia. And it has even been suggested that maybe these are two facets of the same underlying mechanism, which I don't really believe, but you know, this idea is out there. And so I thought it could be interesting to compare actually just specifically the self other touch design um, to see if, if we find kind of an overlap or not. Because my idea was that actually we would not find an overlap. And just kind of as a side note um, on anorexia, I think there's kind of this maybe misleading focus on anorexia on the visual processing. There's a lot of research where people look at like visual body perception and 
often it's often displayed also in a way where it's like you see this like a skinny woman looking in the mirror and see him, a larger woman but i think a lot of it is actually less the visual aspect but a lot more kind of the body physical perception of the self so if you talk to these patients you often hear something where they say like it, it feels like my body doesn't end or it feels like I, that there's no borders and i'm just kind of endless or if i feel i sit on a chair and it feels like i'm just coming out on the side of the chain. So it's a lot of it, it seems to be very much this kind of the, the bodily perception that the, from the inside, way more than kind of this, this visual aspect. So we wanted to look at anorexia and autism and compare them. And we did this in, again in samples, two samples of um, young adults. And in this case, we clearly, said like the ones who have an anorexia diagnosis cannot have an autism diagnosis and vice versa. And my idea was actually that, so for anorexia, I think that the hypothesis would be very clear. So here my idea was that there would be less self other distinction in anorexia, right? Because if you don't feel the borders of your own body, then probably you don't really know where you end and you have kind of less of a distinction between this is me and this is the outside world. But for autism, I think it's less clear I kind of based on on the ADHD findings that I had before, I also thought that probably there might be an increase in self other distinction and also because they also do experience very much the kind of this hypersensitivity through somatosensory and other stimulations. But at the same time, there's some uh, work that looks kind of more like higher order aspects of self other distinction in autism and that work suggests that there might actually be an increase in self other merging in autism. So wasn't fully sure exactly on he, this, but I, I did think that specifically to the tactile self other distinction that this might be something that actually differentiates anorexia and autism. So again, we had the people come to the lab and they did the same touch task. They touched their own arm or we touched their arm or they touched the pillow, the control condition. And what we found here is that we had um, a main effect of group so we had a group of anorexia participants, a group of autism participants and control group. And we find the main effect of group um, in these areas that you see here for self and other touch. And this was specifically driven by the anorexia group. So when we look at the parameter estimates, we can see that this is now for other touch. We can see that in some sensory cortex and in the posterior STS, we had more activations in the anorexia group compared to the other two groups. While the autism group here in, um, in blue did not actually differ from the control group. And then for self-touch, we actually found the same thing. So for self-touch, we also had more activations in the anorexia group compared to the other two groups and autism did not differ compared to the control group. Now, this was not exactly what I expected because I thought there would be maybe a larger, a smaller difference between um, self and other touch in anorexia, but they, they, actually the difference was not changed. It was just that they had kind of a, a shift and like a strong, stronger activation in both conditions. But the autism group did not differ from the control group, which of course, and I think that's very important, could of course be confounded by the sample because we have people who come to the lab who are willing to participate in a touch experiment, right? So it's probably not the people who are extremely aversive to being touched by someone else. So this might be, of course, a sampling bias. And I think that's very important to address here. So in this study, um, we find that there's evidence for altered self-touch processing in anorexia. And we find that there's evidence for altered social touch processing in anorexia. But we did not find any evidence for altered touch processing in autism. But again, this is probably to be treated carefully, this result, because of the potential sampling bias. So my interpretation of this is that maybe in anorexia, we have a reliance on, on a wrong prior or a wrong prediction about the body. So basically, if you have this idea that your body is a lot larger and then you expect, you know, you have certain priors and expectations of how is it going to feel if I touch myself? But then if you touch yourself and it feels different than this prediction would say, then I think that might lead to this stronger activation that we see during self-touch. So actually the, 
self-touch attenuation that we find in the neurotypical participants is something that might not occur in anorexia because of the wrong priors or predictions about the bodily shape or where or how this is going to feel to touch yourself. And uh, taken together, we see that there's a different um, profile in this tactile self other distinction in these three different conditions, anorexia, autism, and ADHD. And we're currently running also a study in schizophrenia, which will be very interesting to look at um, in comparison to the, the ketamine study that we, that we did. So I hope um, I can convince you that self other touch is very crucial for developing and maintaining the bodily self. And considering that, just kind of as a side note, I want to add at the end that we have to really consider the importance of also specifically the social touch because we now live in a situation where we do a lot of this. We're looking at our phones alone and isolated and we're not together with other people. And all our phones and communications that we have to them, they are, of course, they simulate the visual sense and they simulate the auditory sense, but there's no tactile interaction that we experience. So I think it's very important that we consider the importance of social tactile interactions for having kind of a healthy bodily self-perception and also healthy um, social interactions. So I don't want to be like a big tech critic, so I'm not saying what should we do instead, but maybe more what should we do in addition um, to this digitalization that we are experiencing. And I would say, or I would um, suggest that we need to specifically with regard to development of children, that we need to prevent sensory deprivation, but not just for the children, also for us adults, actually, that we need to support um, the perception of the bodily self and these sensory relations that we have with the world and promote interpersonal competencies. And just because you guys are probably mostly German, I have to do a little uh, advertisement for, if you want to read less scientific, but more popular science stuff about this, you can buy one of my books if you want to. And otherwise, um, this is my lab, this is my group in Lynch Shopping. Um, most of this work was done by my postdocs, Reynaud and Paula, and my PhD students, Morgan and Adam. And Andrea is um, the psychiatrist who helps me recruit all these different patient groups, which is very difficult. And um, yeah, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe you have some questions. <laughs>